Join me now as we lift up our hearts, proclaiming the resurrection, as we read John 20, 1 through 18. Early in the morning of the first day of the week, while it was still dark, Mary Magdalene came to the tomb and saw that the stone had been taken away from the tomb. She ran to Simon Peter and the other disciple, the one whom Jesus loved, and said, They've taken the Lord from the tomb, and we don't know where they've put him. Peter and the other disciple left to go to the tomb. They were running together, but the other disciple ran faster than Peter and was the first to arrive at the tomb. Bending down to take a look, he saw the linen cloths lying there, but he didn't go in. Following him, Simon Peter entered the tomb and saw the linen cloths lying there. He also saw the face cloth that had been on Jesus' head. It wasn't with the other clothes, but was folded up in its own place. Then the other disciple, the one who arrived at the tomb first, also went inside. He saw and believed. They didn't yet understand the scripture that Jesus must rise from the dead. Then the disciples returned to the place where they were staying. Mary stood outside near the tomb crying. As she cried, she bent down to look into the tomb. She saw two angels dressed in white, seated where the body of Jesus had been, one at the head and one at the foot. The angels asked her, Woman, why are you crying? She replied, They have taken my Lord away, and I don't know where they've put him. As soon as she had said this, she turned around and saw Jesus standing there, but she didn't know it was Jesus. Then Jesus said to her, Woman, why are you crying? Who are you looking for? Thinking he was the gardener, she replied, Sir, if you have carried him away, tell me where you've put him and I will get him. Jesus said to her, Mary? She turned and said to him in Aramaic, Rabuni, which means teacher. Jesus said to her, Don't hold on to me, for I haven't yet gone up to my father. Go to my brothers and sisters and tell them, I'm going up to my father and your father, to my God and your God. Mary Magdalene left and announced to the disciples, I've seen the Lord. Then she told them what he said to her. Christ is risen. Christ is risen
stands. Even death no longer stands between us and God. If death is no longer an impediment, we can be sure that our sin is not either. Let us confess our sins that they may be washed away by the mercy of our risen Lord. Merciful God, we don't always recognize Christ, even when we are looking directly at your incarnate love. We cling to our assumptions about how life on earth should unfold, forgetting that life in your realm shatters those expectations. Forgive us when we go through our daily routine, forgetting to look for signs of resurrection. Forgive us when our coming to worship is less about encountering you, our risen Lord, and more about the things of this world. Open our eyes and our hearts, O God, to the full awareness of your presence with us in each and every moment of our lives. And hear the sins we now name silently. Israelites 
by proclaiming the good news through Jesus Christ. He is Lord of all. You know what happened throughout Judea, beginning in Galilee after the baptism John preached. You know about Jesus of Nazareth, whom God anointed with the Holy Spirit and endowed with power. Jesus traveled around doing good and healing everyone oppressed by the devil because God was with him. We are witnesses of everything he did, both in Judea and in Jerusalem. They killed him by hanging him on a tree. But God raised him up on the third day and allowed him to be seen, not by everyone, but by us. We are witnesses whom God chose beforehand, who ate and drank with him after God raised him from the dead. He commanded us to preach to the people and to testify that he is the one whom God appointed as judge of the living and the dead. All the prophets testify about him, that everyone who believes in him receives forgiveness of sins through his name. And we've heard John's account of the resurrection, the morning. This is Luke's account, chapter 24, the first 12 verses. Very early in the morning on the first day of the week, the women went to the tomb bringing the fragrant spices they had prepared. They found the stone rolled away from the tomb, but when they went in, they didn't find the body of the Lord Jesus. They didn't know what to make of this. Suddenly, two men were standing beside them in gleaming bright clothing. The women were frightened and bowed their faces toward the ground, but the men said to them, Why do you look for the living among the dead? He isn't here, but has been raised. Remember when he told you while he was still in Galilee that the human one must be handed over to sinners, be crucified, and on the third day rise again. Then they remembered his words. When they returned from the tomb, they reported all these things to the eleven and the others. It was Mary Magdalene, Joanna, Mary, the mother of James, and the other women with them who told these things to the apostles. Their words struck the apostles as nonsense, and they didn't believe the women. But Peter ran to the tomb. When he bent over to look inside, he saw only the linen cloth. Then he returned home wondering what had happened. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God.
About 35 years ago, my aunt died very unexpectedly. My uncle called my mother, his sister, and asked if she would make the calls to their paternal aunts and uncles, as mom was closer both emotionally and geographically to all of them. Mom agreed and began the phone calls. She called Aunt Beth and Uncle Dick in Atlanta and told them. She called Uncle Jean and Aunt Nat in Florence, South Carolina at their retirement home. And she called Aunt Dot in Charleston, South Carolina. Now, my Aunt Dot was a wonderful woman, warm and caring. You aren't supposed to have favorites, but she was my favorite of all the great aunts and uncles. She taught third grade for decades. She was a great cook. She loved her family. So my mother called and told her about the massive heart attack, told her that Aunt Marge had died. And my aunt got responded, oh, Peggy, are you sure? I'm certain my mother worked very hard to keep the smile out of her voice when she said, yes, ma'am, I'm sure. Aunt Marge's death was so unexpected that are you sure wasn't an outrageous response, unless you consider the fact that no one tells that kind of story about a family member unless they're sure. Now, I would imagine that are you sure was among the kinder responses Mary got when she ran from the tomb to announce that Jesus' body had been taken. Grave robbing was apparently a common crime of the time, and I can imagine from John's gospel that Peter and John immediately jumped up from where they were and ran all the way to the tomb to see for themselves. They looked in and saw the cloths, but didn't see Jesus, and they were sure that he was gone. The writer of John's Gospel says that this wasn't enough to convince Peter of anything other than the fact that Jesus' body was gone. But the writer does say that the beloved disciple, presumably John, believed simply on the basis of seeing the grave clothes. Believing or unbelieving, Peter and John returned to their homes. But Mary stayed. And in staying, Mary sees something that neither Peter nor John had seen. Two luminous angels in the tomb. This was Mary's first look in the tomb. If you remember, she didn't look when she first got there. She had seen the stone rolled away. And she, we assume that she assumed that grave robbers had been there. And she ran to tell the disciples. But when she does finally look in, there are two figures that had they been there earlier, Peter and John could not have failed to see. In her conversation with them, she says that she's crying because she doesn't know where Jesus' body is. Neither her first thought nor her second was resurrection. She turns around, and to be honest, if she isn't gawking at two angels sitting there, then she was really distracted by her grief. She turns around to leave because she hears a noise behind her. We don't know why she turned around, but she did. And there was a person standing there. And she begins a conversation with him. Now keep in mind, in this entire telling of the story, Mary has really said the same thing to the disciples, to the angels, to the gardener now, only one thing over and over again, they've taken Jesus. Where is Jesus? She says it one more time. If you'll tell me where they've taken him, I will take his body. 
I think Mary's devotion to Jesus is part is the tenderest part of this story. Peter's actions say, well, Jesus' body is gone. Guess I'll go home. And even John seems to say, well, Jesus is resurrected. Guess I'll go home. But Mary stays, is determined, will not stop asking the same questions over and over until she gets a satisfactory answer. Because this is Jesus, who she loves. Even when she thinks there's no life left in Jesus, she will not abandon him. I think that's the model of discipleship to which we should all aspire. But then with one word, her world changes. That word is her name. Mary. God speaks her name and all of a sudden, it's real. Real for Mary, anyway. You know, fairly regularly, someone will take a poll to see how many Americans believe that the resurrection of Jesus from the dead was a real event. In 2021, a poll conducted by LifeWay Research returned the result that 66% of Americans polled believe the biblical accounts of Jesus' body res bodily resurrection are completely accurate. Two-thirds of those Americans polled say yes to the resurrection. The number from a Rasmussen report poll in 2010 was 78%. 12 years ago, 78% of Americans polled believed that Jesus Christ was raised from the dead. In 2003, the number was 80%. Down 2% between 2003 and 2010. Down another 12% since 2010. I give you the numbers not because I expect it will influence you, how you believe, or how I believe in the resurrection. I fully believe in the resurrection of Jesus Christ. I believe that our, our denomination's language of considering funerals as a service of witness to the resurrection, both Jesus' resurrection and ultimately our own, is absolutely on point. But I think the numbers offer us something to consider on this Easter day. Go back to Mary and Jesus in John's Gospel. Mary apparently wants to hug Jesus, which is completely understandable. Jesus says, don't hold on to me. Things can't go on the way they were before. Jesus is in a transitional time, not just earthly Jesus, but not yet fully ascended Christ. Whoever he is, though, he has work for Mary to do. Go, he says, tell my family. That Jesus. He still thinks of the disciples and believers as family. Even though 11 twelfths of the disciples betrayed, abandoned, or outright denied him between Thursday night and Sunday morning. But siblings they are in Jesus' eyes. Go and tell them, Jesus instructs Mary. And she does. I have seen the Lord, she tells the disciples. And she tells them everything that happened. The conversation with the angels. Seeing Jesus. The message that he gave. She makes the resurrected Jesus real for them. And that, I think, is where those poll numbers challenge us. We believe in the resurrection of Jesus Christ, but have we made it real for the rest of the world? Easter is real. Chocolate bunnies and candy 
egg-filled eggs, Peter Cottontail hopping down a bunny trail and an Easter bonnet with all the frills upon it. Easter is a wonderful celebration of new life and the life-giving renewal of spring. But have we made the resurrection of Jesus Christ real for the world? It's not an easy task. In Luke's Gospel, Mary Magdalene, Joanna, Mary the mother of James, and the other women all go back to the disciples and tell what they've seen. And the disciples don't believe them. Can't be real, they think. Well, except for Peter, according to Luke's Gospel. He goes and looks, but even he doesn't see anything and returns home wondering what had happened. If Jesus' best friends don't believe the truth, how in the world are we supposed to convince the world? I did a quick online search asking how to make Easter special at church. It was probably a mistake. <laughs> the links took me to ideas like giving away swag with the church logo on it or setting up a photo booth sponsoring an Easter egg decorating contest. Today can be a day of big productions around Christ Church, but did you notice that in the Gospels, both Luke and John's accounts, the inbreaking of God's resurrection spirit into the world is a pretty normal thing. It's a day like all the other days. Other Gospels give us soldiers fainting away in fear and pre-dawn earthquakes as stones crack open. But not here. Here it's just regular people on their regularly appointed rounds. Do we need Hollywood-worthy spectacles to make the resurrection real? Bouncy houses? magic tricks? I suspect that the only thing we really need is what Jesus needed. Witnesses. Someone who will go and tell others that they have seen the risen Lord. That's what Peter said in Acts 10. God raised him on the third day and allowed him to appear not to all the people, but to us who were chosen by God as witnesses. He commanded us to preach to the people and to testify that he is the one chosen by God. Jesus didn't need the spectacle. Jesus needed witnesses. Witnesses who would talk, who would tell the story. One of the ways we make the resurrection real is to continue to tell the story as it happened in Scripture. It's one way that we can keep telling that story. But we can also make visible the fact that God's resurrection wasn't a one-time event. God continues to bring new life today. Where we might fall down is in thinking that Easter is about lily-decked, light-filled rooms of people in new clothes. We might fall down in thinking that Easter is about families gathered around a table loaded with food. The truth is, Easter happens for us where it happened for Jesus and Mary and the disciples. Easter happens where death is. Easter happens in the ER when the doctor comes in with bad news. Easter happens in funeral homes. Easter happens in crack houses, in broken families, in hospice facilities, and in war zones. Easter happens where death is, because that's where Easter is needed. 
Jesus asked Mary, why are you crying? Mary's crying because she's around death. Notice that Jesus doesn't tell her to stop crying. Jesus knew that he and Mary both needed tears if they're going to get the full meaning of what she was about to learn. That we have the hope of new life smack where we need it the most, in the middle of a world full of death and dying. That's what we need to tell the world and where we need to be doing the telling. Because if we have faith, then we too have seen the Lord. We, like Mary, are called to witness to the resurrection, not because Christians don't cry or mourn or jump to the happy stuff, but because it's in the midst of tears that Easter can happen. The fact that God physically raised Jesus' body means that physically embodied life matters. So when you live Christ's teachings about loving one another, you say Christ is risen. When you speak out about corruption in places of power, you say Christ is risen. When you open your ears to the cries of the fallen, you say, Christ is risen. When you give or receive unearned love, you say, Christ is risen. Clarence Jordan, farmer, New Testament Greek scholar, founder of Koinonia Farm, said it this way, the proof that God raised Jesus from the dead is not the empty tomb, but the full hearts of transformed disciples. The crowning evidence that he lives is not a vacant grave, but a spirit-filled fellowship not a rolled away stone, but a carried away church. Is it real? The world asks. Are you sure? It isn't just your mouth that should answer. Your lives should also. Your life should say, yes, Christ is risen. Christ is risen indeed. To God be the glory, now and forever. Amen.
Jesus was dead and buried, but God raised him from the dead. The risen Lord appeared to his followers. They recognized him as their master who had been crucified. Before Jesus left them, he commissioned them to proclaim to all people the good news of his victory over death and the promise to be with them always. We are certain that Jesus lives. He lives as God with us, touching all of human life with the presence of God. He lives as one of us with God, because he shares our humanity and has bound us to himself in love. We have an advocate in the innermost life of God. We declare that Jesus is Lord. His resurrection is a decisive victory over the powers that deform and destroy human life. His Lordship is hidden. The world appears to be dominated by people and systems that do not acknowledge His rule. But His Lordship is real. It demands our loyalty and sets us free from the fear of all lesser lords who threaten us. We maintain that ultimate sovereignty now belongs to Jesus Christ in every sphere of life. Jesus is Lord. He has been Lord from the beginning. He will be Lord at the end. Even now, He is Lord. Please be seated. Scripture reminds us that Jesus shared a final meal with his disciples, and so we gather here today remembering that meal, but also anticipating the heavenly feast when we will all gather together and feast in glory with Jesus. This is not a Presbyterian table. Jesus Christ is your host as he is mine, and he invites all those who trust in him to come and share in this feast. We begin our meal with thanksgiving. The Lord be with you. And also with you. Lift up your hearts. To the Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is our right to give our thanks and praise. We offer our entire being to you, God of creation, who made the sun and the moon to govern by day and by night, and hung the stars in the sky. We offer our entire being to you. Great God, who hollowed out the valleys and bulged up the mountains, who spat out the seven seas and populated the world with glorious creatures. Blessed be the name of the Lord who created us and fashioned us from the dust and breathed into us the breath of life. Blessed be the name of the Lord Jesus Christ who came to us in spite of our destructive ways. He healed the sick, raised the dead, and cast out demons. In the brief time that he was with us, Jesus sided with the oppressed, had compassion for those who suffer, and gave dignity to women and children. He taught us in word and deed, making God real to humans who didn't always understand. In spite of his glory revealing presence among us, for us, he became a man of sorrows, acquainted with grief. Jesus was persecuted by religious leaders and betrayed by one of his own. He was lied about, tortured, and hung on a cross to die. But even on the day of his crucifixion, he continued to teach those who would listen. When evil people came with his betrayer, Jesus did not respond with violence. When he was falsely accused and condemned to death, he refused to do harm. And while on the cross, he prayed to you, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. We give you thanks, O God, that nothing ever was or ever will be able to separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus our Lord. We give you thanks that early on the morning of the third day, Jesus laughed at death, shed his grave clothes, and walked among us alive. Forty days later, he ascended into heaven, where he is seated at your right hand, God of our ancestors. 
Our eyes are turned toward the skies looking for the day when Jesus will return to a kingdom without end, for the lion will lie down peaceably with the lamb, for sickness and disease are not known, where the wicked will cease from troubling and we will study war no more. Today, Jesus, we remember the bread and the cup. Today, we remember your life and your death. Today, we remember your resurrection. We remember eternal life. Holy God, pour out your spirit upon these gifts of bread and wine. Make them be for us the body and blood of Christ. Pour out your spirit upon us as we offer ourselves to be God's presence in the world until Jesus returns in glory. As your church celebrates the resurrection all over the world, we ask that you strengthen those who are being baptized and confirmed today, and those too who will renew their baptismal vows. May this day be one of rebirth and deeper commitment in all of us. Lord, we pray on this Easter day that you would send your spirit upon your people so that the good news may be shared with the world. And even so, we ask for your protection and encouragement for churches facing persecution in places where the world is threatened by your story of love and hope and new life. In this season of new life and new beginnings, we ask you to show us how to look after your world better, to be better stewards, to develop innovative ways to make good use of the world's resources so that all may have a fair share. Sovereign Lord, give wisdom to our leaders and the leaders of the world at large that they may recognize you in unexpected places, that instead of vying for power, they may strive to work with and for their constituents, that they may recognize the value of life of people far and near. God of peace, we pray for all the places in the world that need more peace. We pray for Jackson and surrounding areas, where conflict and violence seem unchecked and despair grows daily for some of our friends and neighbors. We pray for places where wars continue to threaten the stability of the nations and the lack of peace has caused so much destruction. Places where people have to flee their homes, their families destroyed, lives lost. We pray for the people of Syria, for the people of Iraq and Yemen and Somalia, for the people of Mexico and Libya and the Democratic Republic of Congo. We pray for the people of Ukraine, and we pray for world governments to respond with compassion and wisdom. We give you thanks for church ministries and organizations reaching out to refugees, and for people who are opening their homes and hearts to offer safe refuge. We pray that whatever evil intends, that you, Lord, will turn it around for your glory, so that in the midst of it all, the cross stands tall. Lord, in comfort, we ask that you be with all those who suffer pain and anguish, for those who are ill and in need of healing. We pray for those within our congregation, for our friends, our family, and neighbors, and for those known only to you. We pray for the brokenhearted and for the lonely, that your very presence would comfort them in their time of need. Holy God, we pray for those whose hearts have been saddened by the death of someone close and dear to them. Give to them the consolation that only you can give, and let them know the comforting power of the resurrection of Jesus. Faithful God, as we go out into the world, we pray that we may reflect your love in our families, our church, our community, so that the world can witness that we are followers of the risen Christ and draw others into your loving care. By the mystery of his passion, Jesus Christ, your risen Son, has conquered the powers of death and sin and restored in humanity the image of your glory. 
He has placed us once more in paradise and opened to us the gate of life eternal. And so in the joy of this feast, earth and heaven resound with gladness. And we pray in the name of the one who taught us to pray, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thy is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. On the night he was betrayed, our Lord took bread, and when he had blessed it, he broke it, and gave it to his disciples, saying, Take, eat, this is my body broken for you. And in the same manner he took the cup, and said, This cup is the new covenant in my blood, sealed for you for the forgiveness of sins. Drink all you of it. Friends, as often as we eat this bread and drink this cup, we proclaim the Lord's death until he comes again. And he will come. But until then, he offers us these, the gifts of God for the people of God. Pray together. On the day of your resurrection, Lord Jesus, you were made known to your disciples in the breaking of bread. May we, having shared this meal, feel the same sense of joy today as they felt long ago. May we joyously continue on our way to Emmaus or wherever we go.
So I charge you to go out and make it real for everyone you meet. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord's face shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord's countenance be lifted up upon you and give you peace, now and forever.